Guys, welcome to Real Classic Film Reviews and welcome to the Greatest Movie Year series where we cast a spotlight on a specific year in movie history. And on this episode, we're looking at 1967, um, a year in movies that's widely regarded to be one of the most groundbreaking and revolutionary years in film. Now here, the bubbling youth culture that had been simmering away after the war had really exploded during the 60s and as the 70s began to drift into view, a huge challenge to convention and authority crept even further into society, uh, with 1967 seeing the cultural milestone the Summer of Love spread across the US. Um, here we had hippie music, um, hallucinogenic drugs and free love going with it. Uh, unfortunately, that long hot summer of 67 also brought with it hundreds of race riots across the United States. And here in the UK, the Beatles reached their zenith with the summer release of Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, um, a balloon that was burst only two months later when their manager Brian Epstein was found dead, uh, full of drink and drugs. Uh, the UK was also entering the modern world in a big way with the introduction of the first ATM machine and, drumroll please, colour television. Um, <laughs> in cinema, the counterculture was in true effect with classics like Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde and Mike Nichols' The Graduate. Uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's so many great films to talk about. Let's take a look. Actually, let's kick things off with a look at Bonnie and Clyde, um, a film, despite being a 30s period piece, perfectly encapsulates the youth culture versus establishment atmosphere of that time. Um, a retelling of the Barrow Gang's 21-month crime spree across the central states of America. It catapulted both Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway into megastardom. Now, the titular pair seeing their crimes as almost a game uh, and the authorities just obstacles in their fun. Um, I've never personally been a big Warren Beatty fan but Faye Dunaway here is something else. Uh, she'd go on to dominate the 70s but this may still be her most iconic role. Now the film itself became iconic for its frank depictions of violence uh, but certainly in a bullet riddled finale that set the stage for the incoming bloodshed of films like The Godfather and Taxi Driver. Now let's keep the bullets flying with a quick look at one of my favourite war movies of the 60s, uh, of course, Robert Aldrich's The Dirty Dozen. Uh, this starred Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, uh, Charles Bronson, Robert Ryan, uh, George Kennedy, who else am I forgetting, Ralph Meeker, Donald Sutherland, Telly Savalas, what a cast. Uh, the plot, if that matters, uh, is one that you'll have heard of many, many times. Um, it's, of course, a top secret mission to infiltrate a chateau of high-ranking German officers by taking the army's worst prisoners um, and training them to be a fighting unit, a suicide squad, if you will. And the prisoners who survive the mission will receive pardons for their past crimes. Um, now, this film was a massive success and the kind of man's man action adventure escapade that made the horrors of the Second World War uh, just look like a weekend away with the boys. Now, The Graduate is a defining film from 1967, uh, the 60s in general, really. Uh, nominated for half a dozen Oscars, but only winning Best Director after In the Heat of the Night cleaned up that year. This is the movie where a 30-year-old Dustin Hoffman plays a 21-year-old graduate who has an eventful summer bouncing between Anne Bancroft's Mrs. Robinson and her daughter Elaine, uh, played by Catherine Ross. Uh, I'm not sure how well some of its youthful defiance has aged but if you've never seen it you'll certainly be aware of its influence in pop culture um it's music by simon and garfunkel and you'll have seen it parodied in everything from wayne's world audi commercials the simpsons etc so as i mentioned uh, in the heat of the night pinched that year's oscars and in my opinion that's fine because it's a better film uh, possibly norman jewison's best film uh, it throws sydney poitier and rod steiger together in a, a story of small town murder abortion and racism hey, what did they call you up there they call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs? Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs, take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now. And the cast, which also includes Lee Grant and Warren Oates, is excellent. Uh, Poitier's black police detective going head-to-head -head with small-town bigotry was released in the summer of 1967 at the tail end of a huge spate of destructive race riots, which is some crazy timing. What you doing here, man? Policeman. You're a policeman here in Sparta? They've got a murder they don't know what to do with. They need a whipping boy. Now, I, I can't speak from any personal experience, but the film oddly doesn't seem like it's aged. Uh, I can quite imagine certain areas of the world still being exactly like this today. Uh, the film was followed by two sequels, uh, They Call Me Mr. Tibbs in 1970 and The Organisation in 1971, which I haven't seen. Uh, Poitier also appeared in the excellent Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Uh, I've made a video discussing that film, which I'll leave a link to in the description. So on the 15th of December 1966, 
Um, a gentleman by the name of Walter Elias Disney passed away in Burbank, California, uh, midway through the production of its 19th animated feature, The Jungle Book. Uh, one of my personal favourites from the Disney back catalogue, um, of course, based on Rudyard Kipling's series of short stories from the late 1890s. Uh, this is the tale of Mowgli's man cub, raised by wolves and taught the bare necessities by a bear, and avoiding the unwanted attentions of a man eating tiger. Um, it has a brilliant soundtrack, um, a great team of Disney voice artists who pop up time and again throughout this era, uh, such as the great Phil Harris as Baloo. Um, it arrived at the end of Disney's golden run throughout its first few decades, uh, when they were casually churning out masterpieces. Uh, ultimately, the 70s and 80s wouldn't be kind to Disney, uh, and it wouldn't be until 22 years later that they had another Stone Cold classic on their hands uh, when The Little Mermaid was released. Let's quickly chat about some of the westerns from 1967. Um, one in particular that I want to mention is Howard Hawks' remake of his own Rio Bravo with John Wayne. Uh, but first, some honourable mentions. Um, a couple of Lee Van Cleef favourites arrived this year, uh, Day of Anger and Death Rides a Horse. Uh, John Wayne also appeared in The War Wagon with Kirk Douglas, and Kirk Douglas appears again in Way of the West with Robert Mitchum and Richard Widmark. Uh, Paul Newman appeared in Hombre, and there was a Django movie, um, the name of which I can't remember. It's Django Kill something or someone. I'll, I'll put the image up here anyway. But yeah, now I do love Howard Hawks' Rio Bravo, but I'll always have a soft spot for 1967's El Dorado, uh, mostly because I watched it first. Uh, they're the same movie, really, but here Mitchum takes over from the Dean Martin role as the drunk deputy, and James Kahn takes over from Ricky Nelson as the young guitar player. Uh, Rio Bravo, I feel, is a better film, technically. Um, it's certainly more famous, helped in no small part by Quentin Tarantino's love for it. Uh, but El Dorado is a slightly darker reimagining of the story in many ways. I'm sure other Western purists will feel it's superfluous in the light of Rio Bravo's existence, but I like it and I think it's worth a watch. Now, before we have one of our little quick whistle-stop tours of the rest of the year, I think I need to include this year's James Bond entry, You Only Live Twice, which is significant in that it was Temporarily, of course, Sean Connery's retirement from the 007 franchise. Um, it was his fifth Bond film in five years, and the franchise had peaked in a lot of ways. Um, in regards to his outlandishness, um, it had a supervillain in a volcano base, giant spaceships swallowing other spaceships, uh, Sean Connery's ill-advised Japanese disguise. Um, it wouldn't get this daft again until Moonraker 12 years later. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. Yes, this is my second life. You only live twice, Mr. Bond. Target vehicle passing over central Russia. Now, of course, Sean Connery wouldn't be back for 1969's underrated on a Majesty's Secret Service, uh, George Lazenby temporarily taking the mantle. Um, oh, yeah, and 1967 would also see the release of the first screen version of Casino Royale with David Niven as 007 and an all star cast. So let's explore some of the other little corners of 1967. Uh, Louis Bunnell and Jean-Pierre Melville delivered both Belle de Jour and Le Samurai, uh, the first featuring Catherine Deneuve as a bored housewife coming alive in the world of high-class prostitution, um, and the second featuring Alan Delon's betrayed and hunted assassin out for revenge that might just be the greatest hitman movie ever made. Uh, Martin Scorsese released his first feature film this year with Who's That Knocking At My Door? Uh, and Mel Brooks's hilariously un-PC The Producers arrived, uh, featuring the now infamous play Springtime for Hitler. Winter for Poland and France Come on Germans, go into your dance now, in terms of British cinema, we've got Ken Loach's first feature film, Poor Cow, which is excellent, but is quite a difficult watch. And Joseph Losey's Accident was also released. Dirk Bogard and Stanley Baker in a love triangle with the stunning uh, Jacqueline Sassard. Now, let's finish up with one of my favourite films from 1967, Cool Hand Luke. Uh, we have Paul Newman here sentenced to a couple of years on a southern chain gang. His stubborn refusal to bow down to authority gives him a harder time than usual. What we've got here is... Failure to communicate. Some men you just can't reach. So you get what we had here last week, which is the way he wants. Um, it's one of cinema's great prison movies. Paul Newman was already a star by this point in his career due to films like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and The Hustler and Hood. Uh, but he was about to go on a run here that included Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, uh, Macintosh Man, The Sting. The Towering Inferno. Uh, cool Hand Luke was directed by Stuart Rosenberg, who'd mostly directed TV shows and wouldn't reach the quality of this again throughout his career. Uh, cool Hand Luke's one of the great American films of the 60s. 
Now, there's so many more movies that could be mentioned, of course. Uh, what are some of your favourites from 1967 or the 60s in general? Uh, what have I missed? I'm sure there's so many more we could chat about. Uh, but until the next Greatest Movie Years episode, thanks so much for watching. Happy viewing. He beats you with nothing. Just like today when he kept coming back at me with nothing. Yeah, well... Sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand.